Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, and the title of the sermon is Tongues of Fire, as we celebrate this Pentecost Sunday. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Hear now the word of the Lord. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In Michael Horton's book, Rediscovering the Holy Spirit, he begins by making reference to a New York Times best-selling book, uh, Heaven is for Real. It was also turned into a movie. Some of you may have seen that movie. The book recounts this experience of a three-year-old boy who dies during emergency surgery and, and comes back to life. And he tells this story, this little three-year-old boy, about what he saw in that experience, that death experience, if you will. He talked about seeing his grandparents, and he described them in great and vivid detail. He spoke about seeing Jesus. And again, he describes this vision with great detail, describing Jesus as having sea green, bluish eyes and having a rainbow horse. And the boy also describes seeing the angel Gabriel and God the Father. And again, in vivid detail, he gives these descriptions. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit, when it came to the Holy Spirit, I should say, the boy struggled uh, to describe him. He simply stated this. He said the Holy Spirit was bluish, but hard to see. Bluish, but hard to see. In many ways, I think that is indicative of our own way of understanding or contemplating or conceiving of the Holy Spirit ourselves, right? It's kind of hard to get a grasp on who the Holy Spirit is. I mean, we all have images in our head, whether they're in Hecate or not, they're usually not, but we kind of can envision God the Father, we can envision God the Son, but when it comes to the Holy Spirit, it's hard, right? He's bluish, but hard to see. Maybe a dove comes to your mind as an image of the Holy Spirit. Maybe it's light, or maybe it's wind. We tend to see the Holy Spirit to conceive of Him and understand Him through symbols. Take a look for a moment at this painting. If you guys would put up that slide now. It's a 16th century painting uh, by, um, by an artist, El Greco. And you can see there that image of Pentecost, and you can see those kind of symbols that we've become so accustomed to, the dove and the light, and maybe you can even envision or feel a little bit of, of wind in that scene there. But there's another symbol in this portrait and in the scriptures, and that is the tongues of fire resting there upon the disciples' heads. It's hard to even translate that in the Scripture, what those tongues really are, where they divided tongues as of fire, but there's clearly fire present in, in the shape of a tongue, this symbolism. And this morning in our time together, I want to consider that particular symbol of Pentecost, those tongues of fire that you see there. I want to think about them and, and ask ourselves this question, what insight? Do those tongues of fire give us into the person and work of the Holy Spirit? Why fire? Why is fire a symbol of the Spirit? What does it symbolize? Because if we can grasp that, we can learn something about the person and work of the Holy Spirit in this world and in our lives. So that's what I want to do. I want to look this morning at what the symbol of fire means. You can take down that slide. And I boil it down to basically two things this morning, two points. I know I'm violating all the rules here this morning. Two points to the sermon. The first point is this. Fire is a symbolic of the presence of God. The first thing fire symbolizes is the presence of God. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning, as well as a thick cloud on the mountain, and a blast of a trumpet so loud that all the people who were in the camp trembled. 
Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. They took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended upon it in fire. That, of course, is a description of Mount Sinai, right? The description of the great covenant-making ceremony, what we call the Mosaic Covenant, the Sinaitic Covenant, or the Old Covenant. It's when God gave His law to His people, and when He gathered them all around in that great moment, that greatest of Old Testament moments, if you will, the Lord descended upon it in fire. Fire symbolizes the presence of God. The fancy theological word for that, for what happened at Sinai, is the word theophany. And theophany means, this is uh, Vern Poythers' definition, a a theophany is an appearance of God, an intense manifestation of the presence of God that is accompanied by an extraordinary visual display. A theophany is when God manifests Himself in this powerful way. His presence is felt acutely, and usually that is manifested through, through a symbol, through some type of visual display. And of course, at Exodus, at the, at the Sinaitic Covenant, at that great moment, God made His presence known through fire. He descended on it in fire. And that's what Exodus was. It was that. Throughout Scripture, fire is symbolic of God's presence. And I can give you other examples. In the book of Genesis, God uh, is working with Abraham, and Abraham's doubting all of these promises he has. So God says, I will make a covenant with you. I will assure you of these promises. And if you remember that chapter where Abraham kind of does this weird thing, right? He divides these animals in half. He cuts them in half. And this was what's called a covenant-making ceremony. And the symbol was, if these animals would be cut in half, that God was saying about Himself, if I fail to complete these promises, fulfill them in your life, let this be done to me what is done to these animals. God was doing something extraordinary. It's called a self-maledictory oath. He could swear by no other, so He swore by Himself. He swore He would do this. And the way He walked through those divided animals is described in Genesis 15, 17, when the sun had gone down and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. God, His presence was there through fire. And of course, probably immediately you're thinking about Moses, right? The burning bush episode where God met him in that moment and revealed himself in another theophany. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. God's presence through fire. And perhaps you're thinking about Israel in the wilderness when they're wandering and how God led them, how He went before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He made His presence known through fire. We see this throughout Scripture. Fire is symbolic of God's presence. And really, it goes much deeper than that. It's not just symbolic. This this symbol of fire is so pervasive to who God is that you find it in all of the spatial realms of creation. We're going to get a little bit nerdy here for a moment, but if you could put up that next slide for me. This, hey, like that? (laughs) Going to have a little fun this morning. Pastor's got a PowerPoint. Thanks to Reba for making this look so nice. So this comes from Vern Poitras in his book on Theophany. But this gives you this picture of fire in the various spatial realms of the created world. We begin with God Himself. God describes Himself as a consuming fire, right? Hebrews 12, 29, for indeed our God is a consuming fire. So within God Himself, there is this description. And then we work outward reflection from God into the courts of heaven itself, And there we see the angels of the Lord in the heavenly courts being described as through the symbolism of fire. Ezekiel 1.13, for example, in the middle of the living creatures, there was something that looked like burning coals of fire, like torches moving to and fro among the living creatures. The fire was bright and the lightning issued from the fire there in the heavenly courts. And if we move on to the entire created universe that God made, 
There's fire in the world, right? There's fire in the sun and the stars. There's fire in the created existence of our lives, the physical creation. And then it comes down to earth when God called his people, right? He calls Israel, and then there's the tabernacle and the temple, the place what? What is that? The place of it's God's house, the place of his presence. And one of the things you find there is fire. Leviticus 6, 12 through 13. The fire on the altar shall be kept burning. It shall not go out. Every morning the priest shall add wood to it. A perpetual fire shall be kept burning on the altar. It shall not go out. Because it's about God's presence and God's house. And then we come to the day of Pentecost, which we just read, which we're celebrating this morning. What happens? God descends again like he did at Sinai, this time in fire upon his church as they are all gathered together. The church, which is the temple of God, has fire. And it's not just the church, but it comes to rest on each and every individual. The scripture is very clear that divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, in the group of them, in the church, but it also rested on each of them, each individual person. It's come to that point in the redemptive historical outgrowth of scripture that fire, the God of fire, becomes present among his people in fire. He manifests himself at Pentecost in a most powerful way. And so what we see is that Pentecost is to the New Testament what, what, what Sinai was to the Old Testament. This is the big moment when God reveals himself in a massive way. It really is the New Testament corollary, Pentecost is, to Sinai. If you look at the parallels, they're amazing, right? Moses ascends Mount Sinai. He goes up the mountain to meet with God. Jesus before Pentecost, ascends into heaven. Moses, as he ascends, ascends into a cloud. Jesus, of course, in Acts 1.9, is concealed in a cloud as he ascends. The 12 tribes are present there at Mount Sinai. In the New Testament, in the book of Acts, just before Pentecost, one of the things they have to do is to replace Judas. They have to get back to the 12 apostles, and they do that right before Pentecost. The new 12 tribes are there. At Sinai, Moses descends with what? He descends with the revelation of God, the ten words, God's revelation to his people. And what happens at Pentecost? People are filled with the Holy Spirit and they prophesy. There's preaching there. All of them begin to utter and people are able to understand in their own languages. And finally, at Sinai, God descended upon that mountain in fire. And at Pentecost, God descended upon his people in fire. And this tells us that Pentecost is about God's presence in an unparalleled, powerful, palpable way. And all of it is made possible through the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit is how God's fire descends upon us. How God is present with us. You can take down that slide. So what does that mean for us? What does that mean for us today? What does the symbol of fire mean to you and to me? Well, think about your own life. Think about human history and human civilization, how important fire was to the development of who we are and what we're doing here today and all the progress of humanity. The invention of fire, the discovery of fire, changed human life and human civilization. Some uh, suggest it's even uh, you know, to our development, our larger brains, because it changed our diets and we were able to consume protein, all those type of things. It had massive social implications and for storytelling, language, education, how we structure our division of labor in society and, and how we became in, in tribes and in, in communities. And although we're more sheltered from it even today, think about how much you've already used fire this very day. As you took a shower this morning and your water heater burst, you know, and, and heated that water through flame. Or as you turned on your stove and you cooked some eggs this morning and fire was there. As you drove the church this morning, most of you likely drove with an internal combustion engine, right? Not all of you, you got, got your electric cars. <laughs> 
But fire is everywhere. We still rely on it. Fire revolutionized how we developed and lived in human. We cannot live without fire the way we do. And really, that's what this is about, how important, how essential it is to have the Holy Spirit, to have the fire of the Holy Spirit in our lives, to live and to walk with Christ. We can't do it without Him. The glory of Pentecost is now there is a pillar of fire in each and every one of our lives. It's not just in some central temple. You are the temple. The fire has descended on you, and you need that to live and to walk and to be a Christian. It is your way of life. It is the fuel, if you will, of the Christian life. The fire of God's presence warms us to the message of Christ. It comforts us. It lights our way. It cleanses us like Isaiah who had his lips cleansed by that coal from the altar. But most of all, it empowers us. It empowers us. His presence, the Holy Spirit empowers us. That's how Jesus described it. Those first disciples needed it and we need it too. Listen to how Jesus spoke of the coming of the Holy Spirit. Luke 24, 49. And see, I am sending upon you what my Father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Until the Spirit comes. Acts 1, 8. Again, Jesus speaking. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It wasn't going to happen without that dynamic of fire in their lives. And the same thing is true today in the 21st century as we disciples of Jesus Christ try to live for Him. We can't live without, for, for God without fire. The fire of the presence of the indwelling of God in the person of the Holy Spirit. Fire is symbolic of His presence. And if God is with us, who can be against us? And where God is present, all things are possible. Fire is symbolic of His presence. Pentecost changed everything because God descended upon His church, upon His people in fire. Fire is symbolic of God's presence. Praise be to God. The second point I have this morning is that fire is symbolic of the judgment of God. Fire is symbolic of the judgment of God. And here we encounter one of these great biblical paradoxes. I've just told you this great news about fire symbolizing the presence of God, how it's comforting, how it's empowering. But at the very same time in Scripture, we're told about fire and the fire of the presence of God as being something that is destructive. The fire that destroys. And in fact, that's how the tongues of fire are used in the Old Testament. Listen to Isaiah 5, 24 to 25. Therefore, as the tongue of fire devours the stubble and as grass sinks down in the flame, so their root will become rotten and their blossom go up like dust. For they have rejected the instruction of the Lord of hosts and have despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. That tongue of fire is about judgment. Isaiah 30, 27 through 30. See, the name of the Lord comes from far away, burning with his anger and in thick rising smoke. His lips are full of indignation and his tongue is like a devouring fire. And Isaiah goes on, and the Lord will cause his majestic voice to be heard and the descending blow of his arm to be seen in furious anger and a flame of devouring fire. Sometimes when God comes in fire, it is in judgment. Isaiah 66, 15, for the Lord will come in fire and his chariots like the whirlwind to pay back his anger and fury and his rebuke and flames of fire. And you might be thinking, well, this is the Old Testament God you're speaking of, Pastor. Everything has changed in the New Testament. But it hasn't. It's there at Pentecost, that same sense of the fire as the judgment of God. John the Baptist speaks about this when he talks about Jesus and his coming. This is what John the Baptist says in Luke 3, 16 and 17. John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, 
but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and what? Fire. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork, here it is, here's the judgment, right? His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff will he burn with unquenchable fire. There's something judicial about this moment, judicial about Pentecost. There's something dividing about those tongues of fire, right? The fire of God that empowers and comforts the church is also the fire that destroys. And Jesus told us this too. He said when the Holy Spirit comes, when He comes, He will come also in judgment. John 6, 7, sorry, John 16, 7 through 11. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send Him to you. And when He comes, He will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment about sin because they do not believe in me, about righteousness because I'm going to the Father and you will see me no longer, about judgment because the ruler of this world has been condemned. As Dennis Johnson put it, the Spirit comes with the life-giving power of a new creation, but there is a dangerous side to this Holy Spirit. That's true. He is the Holy Spirit. So fire is symbolic also of the judgment of God. So what does that mean for us today, knowing that? Well, I think it means we better sober up. We got to take Pentecost seriously, right? Because the fire cuts both ways. It is either to you a blessing or it is to you a curse. In other words, you have a choice how to experience the fire of Pentecost. You can experience it in one of two ways. You can be baptized in one of two ways. It can be for you the fire of God's indwelling presence that changes your life and empowers you to walk with Christ. Or it can be to you the fire of judgment. Yeah, pastor's going to talk a little bit about hell this morning. We don't talk about that much anymore. It's not good for you know, business. It's not good for the product. Uh, you know, it's not good because people don't want to talk about that. We don't like to think about God sending people to hell, right? It's problematic. It's one of those things that comes up when people wrestle with, why would I want to be a Christian? Why do I want to follow a God that you know, sends people to hell? But one of the questions that really comes up about that, is that really true? Does God really send people to hell? Maybe we're not asking the right questions. Tim Keller, in his book, The Reason for God, he deals with this apologetic problem. You know, uh, how, how can you uh, love a God that you know, sends people to hell? And he, he kind of gets at this whole idea that maybe we're asking the wrong question. Perhaps we send ourselves. Keller writes this in the book, Hell, then, is the trajectory of a soul living a self-absorbed, self-centered life, going on and on forever. In short, hell is simply one's freely chosen identity apart from God on a trajectory into infinity. What's he saying? He's saying in a real sense it's our choice, right? C.S. Lewis put it this way, there are only two kinds of people. Those who say, thy will be done to God, or those to whom God in the end says, thy will be done. All that are in hell choose it. Without that self-choice, it wouldn't be hell. I could get into a big debate about Calvinism and all of these issues of you know, how reprobation happens and all of that, but I think there's something to this. And Pentecost was about that. 
And this is what it means to us because this is the very most important thing of all, right? God descends in fire. That fire can comfort, warm, guide, and cleanse, or it can disintegrate, it can destroy. It can be the fire of your justification or the fire of your judgment. The choice is yours. And on that day of Pentecost, when that fire descended, what happened in the immediate aftermath of that? Peter preaches this amazing sermon, right? He puts it to the people that were gathered there. And they, the scripture says they were distressed. They were troubled and what did they say to Peter what 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 are we supposed to do about this what do we do in light of this what does Peter say he says repent repent and be baptized choose God choose him now choose this spirit of justification fire is symbolic of the judgment of God If you put back up that picture for one more moment, the art piece. Now here's the good news. And I'll close with this good news. Because we need good news. You see those tongues there above those disciples? They rest upon their heads, right? Just above their heads. They are there with them. The fire of God's presence. The fire of God's judgment. But it does not consume them. The Scripture is very clear that it came and rested upon each of them. They are not destroyed. They are not disintegrated. They are not consumed. Why? Because of Jesus. Jesus is the entire different. Have you ever wondered why? Why did Jesus wait? Why did he have to wait to Pentecost to send the Holy Spirit? Wouldn't it have been easier to send send him earlier? Why did he have to wait for for his death and resurrection and ascension? Because if he had sent the Holy Spirit before that, we would all be doomed. Right? Because we all deserve God's judgment. That work had to be done first. And what does that tell us? It tells us that Jesus bore all of that judgment for us. He was baptized with fire for us. He even speaks of that. Jesus says in Luke 12, 50, I have a baptism with what's to be baptized and what stress I am under until it is completed. And he completed it. He went to the cross. He went to the grave. He descended and felt the wrath of God, the hellfire flames, right? He was, judgment was poured out on him. So that when the fire came on Pentecost, It was for the church a blessing and not a curse. It's one of the glorious stories of Scripture. Right there in that picture of that fire resting upon their head is the gospel itself. If you choose Christ, that fire of Pentecost, that fire of God's presence, that fire of the Spirit is a blessing and not a curse. So Pentecost presents you with a choice, a choice of how you want to encounter this God who reveals himself as a consuming fire. Choice is yours. I'll close with this poem from T.S. Eliot. The dove descending breaks the air with flames of incandescent terror, of which the tongues declare the one discharge from sin and error. The only hope or else despair lies in the choice of pyre or pyre to be redeemed from fire by fire. That's what Pentecost is about. It's about God redeeming us from fire by fire. Let's pray. O Heavenly Father, we rejoice this morning in God the Holy Spirit, Lord, that you have come to dwell in and among your people, and we praise, O God, for the work of Christ the Son, who endured the wrath of God on our behalf, who cleansed this temple of who we are, that you could come and dwell, you the God of holiness, you the God of fire, You can descend and live and dwell and be in us. Oh, Heavenly Father, empower us through the presence of the Holy Spirit to live for you, to spread that good news, to sober up in our Christian lives, and to live as you have called us to live. 
the knowledge of your grace, your love, and your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.